Next slide. Thank you so much for your time uh, and your attention this evening. Uh, we're going to now go to the questions that you may have. I, I wanna thank you for uh, your, your interest in this topic. Hello everyone. So at this point, we would love to open it up for any questions you might have. There are two ways to do that. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little chat icon with a one message from us and you can type your chat in that way. If you prefer to raise your hand, you will also see a question, a, a box labeled participants. If you click on that, it will open a small window. And if you scroll all the way to the bottom, it will allow you to raise your hand. And I'll go through questions that way. So I'll be moderating the questions for you. If you logged one through the chat, I'll just read them out loud. If you raise your hand, I will unmute you when I call your name and you can ask the questions directly. And that way it gives you time to also ask follow-up questions if you have more detail. So we'll start with the chat very quickly and go from there. Thank you. the window. All right. So first chat question will be, is there an ideal age to have a NUS procedure, Dr. Lasasso? Yes, there is. Um, and again, I think this has something to do with uh, both the physiology of the patient and also the maturity of the patient. So, so for most patients, by the age of 13, they are having generally some sense of this condition. They can participate in the decision-making that uh, is entailed in deciding whether or not one sh should go forward with correction. And it's an excellent time to make an intervention because the uh, patient generally at 13 has not completely expressed the deformity uh, to its maximum extent. So for that reason, I say the sweet spot is somewhere between 13 and 15. The youngest patient I've personally done is 10. It was a patient who had a severe deformity with, with um, severe symptoms. Um, generally, the youngest I will do um, is around 12. The reason for that is because if you leave the bar in for three years, as we just discussed, a 12 year old is then 15 at the time you would begin to think about removing the bar. Most 15 year olds are still growing uh, at a rate that would make it uh, necessary to leave the bar in for additional time. Now, sometimes that's a decision that is in the best interest of the patient. Uh, so uh, the 12 year old sometimes is someone that you will, you know, go forward with repairing. But the older patient, 13, 14, 15, uh, once three years have passed, you're closer to the timeline for the end of growth and being able to remove the bar without worrying that there's gonna be any further growth and risk of recurrence. So the answer, the short answer is 13 to 15. Dr. Lasasa, the next question. Are there any conditions that will not meet the criteria for surgery for PEC to six bottom? Well, I, I think that you can have pectus excavatum, if I'm understanding the questioner's question, um, you can have pectus excavatum that is not severe enough to exceed that minimum threshold, uh, but still have a chest that looks um, uh, physically uh, sunken. Um, and in that instance, that's a time when you can do exercises, use the vacuum bell, and make interventions that are, uh, that, that can uh, help in alleviating the uh, sunkenness, the mild sunkenness, um, 
And so I would say that would be a situation in which you would consider exercise in the vacuum valve. If I'm understanding, the, I think I'm understanding the question correctly. Um, Perhaps. Um, is there certain um, additional characteristics that would preclude you from feeling comfortable doing the NUS procedure? Uh, sure. So um, I would say in the older patient, the adult patient, there could be uh, concomitant uh, morbidities um, uh, that would make one uh, think twice about proceeding with a procedure that is uh, purely elective and meant to improve the quality of one's life. So I think it's important for the older patient with other medical conditions that might make a NUS procedure uh, more challenging that the provider, the surgeon, be experienced in doing adult um, uh, operations, doing adult NUS procedures so that um, uh, the proper judgment could be exercised with regards to um, uh, doing it only uh, when there's more benefit than risk involved. But like any surgical procedure, uh, it's important to weigh risk and benefit. And I can tell you that in older patients in particular, um, the risk can outweigh the benefit. Um, and, and that's something that uh, needs to be uh, clearly kept in mind as one goes through the process of working the patient up. And it's important for the patient to um, have a provider who's experienced in dealing uh, with um, this condition um, uh, frequently and has experience uh, doing it in particular uh, with adult patients. Thank you. Just to reiterate, and along the lines of this question, is there a perfect age to have the NUS procedure? Well, I, I think, again, I would say there's a perfect range of ages. I would say somewhere in the range of 13 to 15. If I had to give you a single number, I would say 13, mainly because a 13-year-old generally has a sense of the condition and can participate in the discussion about whether or not a operation uh, should be performed uh, and is a willing participant in the uh, rehabilitative phase of care um, and, and is young enough so that they've not uh, clearly manifest the full severity of the deformity. So you're not intervening at a time when the deformity is at its maximum. So there is some advantage in doing it at that age to avoid further deformity that may require more extensive corrective steps to be taken in order to achieve a good result. Meaning being able to do it earlier in life with one implant versus later in life with multiple implants. The same outcome is achieved, it just requires uh, more, more work in order to achieve it. So a younger patient can sometimes be corrected with um, a less extensive uh, operation. Thank you. So this question kind of goes hand in hand with the previous one, and we see it all the time. Is the NUS procedure covered by most insurance plans? Well, that's a, that is a great Great question. And I will just be honest with all of my colleagues out there. Um, it does sometimes require a real effort on the part of the patient, the family, and the provider to work together to assemble the information necessary to um, convince the insurance provider that the, um, the benefit of this procedure uh, would be significant for the patient. So um, yes, it is covered. Yes, it is covered. It is a covered condition. However, there are very, very um, 
uh, specific um, uh, uh, in, uh, indications for doing it that um, the insurance company will hold the provider to and um, therefore the provider needs to do a thorough and complete workup and have the experience to present the findings to the insurance company in a way that is both accurate and compelling and allows the patient and family to proceed with the desired correction. So it does take effort, but it can be accomplished and we do it all the time. The next question is one that it might be better to actually have them ask it live. But Mr. and Ms. Miller, you had a question that said, I haven't had a patient get the procedure done in quite some time. In the early 2000s, we've had several patients in whom the bar bent within a fairly short period of time. Is this still a complication for, for you? So Dr. Lasasa, if you need more information on that, and if they're still in the room, which I can say they are, I'd be happy to unmute them and you guys can have a discussion about this. Okay, well, I'll address that question. It's a, it's a great question. So, so Dr. Millers, um, the, the, the operation uh, has evolved over the course of the last 20 years. I did my first operation in 1999. So I've been doing this for over 20 years. I've done over a thousand operations. And I can tell you that the operation has improved. The operation is improved in, the ter in terms of our knowledge of how the bar should be bent, how it should be positioned within the chest and secured, how many bars are necessary, what things can we do to keep the patient safe during the course of positioning the bars within the chest, how do we manage the pain that is associated with the correction uh, so all of these areas have been areas where great strides have been achieved through the efforts of, of, of a provider community which is dedicated to this condition and to the patients who suffer from this condition. And I can tell you that we do a much better job um, in, 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 in providing an effective uh, operation now than we did 20 years ago. But I can tell you, I personally have never had a bar displace and I have never caused the injury to an internal organ uh, uh, in performing this procedure. And so I think those uh, kinds of, um, uh, of, of questions need to be asked of providers doing the operation by patients uh, so that patients can be assured they are going to somebody who is experienced and capable of doing the operation that is required in order to achieve the best results. I can tell you the way you achieve the best results is going to people who do it often and do it uh, um, and do it over all age groups and all severities and have a multidisciplinary team that supports them. This is, this, is, this is truly a programmatic type of treatment. It requires a village to provide the treatment necessary uh, for the patient to achieve the best outcomes. So it's important for for you, the referring physician, and for individual patients and families to do your homework. Identify people who are doing this at a very, very high level of proficiency, okay? And those are the people that should, uh, that should be, you should be directing your patients to, and those are the people who should be, you know, answering the patient's questions and convincing them that they have the experience and, and knowledge uh, and judgment to do the operation well. Does that answer your question? Hey, Dr. Lasasso, it's uh, Steve Miller. Can you hear me? I yes. can. Yes, hi, Dr. Miller. 
How are you? I'm good. Um, uh, I appreciate uh, I appreciate your explaining that uh, the uh, when the procedure was done on uh, really several of our patients back in the early two uh, thousands, um, it was just done by our local uh, pediatric surgeon who was very skilled. But you know we did see this several times, and it really shied us away from even recommending uh, that the procedure be done. So that's that. That was the that was the reasoning for my question. I figured that it was more a technical issue at the time, than you know, than really an, an issue with the procedure itself. Absolutely, Doctor Miller. If if you bend the bra, if you bend the bar properly, and it's art. I mean, to get the bar into a perfect, you know, configuration that matches the patient, it requires sculpting the bar so that it fits perfectly into the patient. Then you have to have good judgment and lots of experience to know where to place the bar and how many bars to place. And then you have to have the experience and skill to know how to optimally anchor the bar or bars in the chest wall. If any of those steps are not done out, uh, optimally, then you have the potential for a less than optimal outcome. So that's where, where experience, judgment, and quite frankly, commitment of the provider and their team is so critical in achieving the best outcomes. Because this isn't an operation that should be done by someone who does it only a few times in the course of a given year. It's something that should be done by people who have an institutional and professional commitment to doing it. And they do it often. And by doing so, they do it well. And so I wanna reassure you that in the right hands, any patient that you may see with a significant deformity can be safely reconstructed and done so with great, you know, with, 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 with great assurance. And, and I wanna reassure you that consider sending your patients because to not send them is to then ensure that they will have these symptoms uh, which, uh, and, and physiologic condition which can really affect the quality of their lives uh, over the long haul. You know, doing, I'm one of the few pediatric surgeons that also does adults. And so I see the effect of having pectus in the third, fourth, and fifth decades. And, a, and almost a perfect storm develops over time where as your aerobic uh, capacity and fitness declines as a result of aging, which happens to us all, no matter how fit we try to maintain ourselves, there is a natural decline. And that coupled with the cardiac inefficiency, the cardiopulmonary in, insuffi uh, um, uh, insufficiency uh, is, um, is, is, a, is a perfect storm later in life. And these patients often will complain of not being able to do the things they love to do with their children, their grown children, their grandchildren, et cetera. So, so it's, it's, it's a really important that patients with the condition have a evaluation done and, and give them the opportunity to uh, correct it uh, once they learn uh, what they need to know about their individual deformity and its impact on them physiologically. That's great, thank you very much. And if, if I could just ask just a quick follow-up question uh, just regarding the bar itself. Sure. Has, the has the material composition of the bar changed significantly over the last 20 years? I'm just trying to get myself into the 21st century with this. Sure, absolutely so. There are really two bars available to practitioners. There's a stainless steel bar and there's a titanium bar. 
with the stainless and those two options have been available since you know the very very early days of doing the nus procedure personally i prefer to use a stainless steel bar mm. because i can personally bend it i can sculpt it i use a bending instrument and i can bend the bar you know millimeter by millimeter to get it to fit perfectly onto the chest okay so i prefer doing that it's sort of the artist in me um however if you have a metal allergy which about 13 to 15 percent of patients in the general population have then that has to be identified and we do skin testing on all patients who are up to undergo the NUS procedure. Therefore, if you do have an allergy to the most common alloy, which is nickel, then a titanium bar is your only option. A titanium bar is bent by Zimmer Biomet or the company that supplies the bar, okay? And it has to be machined mm -hmm. in by by the manufacturer and that's done in a uh, collaboration with the surgical provider and is done using the ct or mri as the um as the map for bending the bar so each provider has a certain you know configuration that they like and if a titanium bar is needed, both the, the, the uh, manufacturer and the provider need to collaborate on how, based on the imaging, the bar should be bent. And that's a, that's a conversation. And then once that's agreed upon, the bar is manufactured and sent to the provider. So, um, that's the long-winded answer to your good question. There's a steel bar and there's a titanium bar. Great. Thank you very much for your, for your presentation. It was very good. I appreciate it. You're welcome, sir. Thank you for your interest. Have a great night. Same to you, sir. So, Dr. Lasasso, this is a question as well that comes up quite often, similar to the insurance question. What's the age of the oldest person you would feel comfortable doing the NUS procedure on? And we know this is a double-ended question, triple-ended, there's all sorts of reasons, but you're one of the few doctors that will address the NUS procedure in an adult at a certain age. That's correct. So just, just to give you a little history, um, I, I, uh, I was in the audience when Dr. Nuss presented his paper to the American Pediatric Surgical Association, and I was lucky enough to have a mutual um, a, a mutual friend of Dr. Nuss. And so after his presentation, I went up to him, I was introduced by this mutual friend and I asked him, can I come and work with you? Can I come and learn this operation from you? And he's such a wonderful, gracious man. He was welcoming and allowed me to come multiple times over the course of a year to learn his operation, not only how to do the operation, but how to care holistically for these patients. And after a year of going back and forth between California and Norfolk, Virginia, where he uh, did his work, I did my first operation. And I did purely children until about the mid 2000s. And suddenly the lay press was uh, beginning to publicize that there was a new operation for patients with this condition. And so adult patients started to reach out to me with the condition and their stories were very compelling. And I just felt, you know, if not me, then who is going to deal with these patients who now are later in life having very significant um, uh, symptoms which were affecting the quality of their life. And if I don't address it, then who will? So I began to see adult patients 
And, um, and then slowly I created a, uh, an adult center adjacent to the pediatric hospital where I was on staff. So I had both an adult and a pediatric program in San Diego from the mid 2000s until I came back to the East Coast in 2016. And what I learned from dealing with adults is that it's, it's the same operation, it's just more challenging. That you're dealing with a more rigid chest wall, you're dealing with uh, a deformity that is fully uh, expressed itself in the adult patient. And you're dealing with patients who can at times have comorbidities. So it required um, a, uh, another level of, of proficiency and expertise in order to um, uh, meet the needs of this uh, uh, separate patient cohort. And, and so I began to do the 20-year-olds and then the 30-year-olds. And then as I did more and more of that work, the oldest patient that I did was 52 at the time of the operation. Um, a gentleman that's on my website, you can go there and, uh, and see pictures of him, a great, great uh, man and um, and somebody who was uh, extremely active and very debilitated by his uh, deformity and wanted to be able to continue to have uh, a, an active life. He was uh, uh, he is from Alaska, so doing active things in the outdoors was something that he 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 wanted to continue to do. And um, he flew down from Alaska to see me in San Diego and I did his operation, which was very challenging. It required two bars. And I'm happy to report that he did very, very well. He's now maybe three years uh, following bar removal. And, uh, and uh, I, uh, I, 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 I consider him one of the uh, finer moments of my career because it was a, a, a difficult operation that we were able to achieve an excellent result on. So 52 is the answer for the oldest and 10 is the answer for the youngest patient that I've done. Dr. Lasasso, is this procedure more complicated in females versus males? Are there any differences when you approach the surgery? Oh, that is a great question. I love that question. So yes, it is different. It's different from an artistic point of view. So when you think about the difference between the male and female chest, you, you, you understand that the female chest tends to be slightly on the concave side and males tend to be more on the sort of convex side, okay? And so, so with females, it's extremely important for the provider to understand that difference and be able to achieve the artistic result that the female chest requires as opposed to the male chest. So how I try to explain that to the lay person is that you want to slightly undercorrect the female patient and you want to slightly overcorrect the adult patient. So, so there's a big, big difference in how you bend the bar with a female versus, <clears throat> excuse me, male patient. And so it's important for the patient and the family to make certain that the provider who's doing it has done a lot of female patients if you're coming to that provider as a female. Um, in terms of anchoring the bar, in terms of one versus two bars, that's pretty standard. 
I find the most important thing is the bend of the bar. That's the big difference between adults. I'm sorry, between uh, females and males. And that's true whether you're a teenager or you're in your later years, you're an adult. Dr. Lissasso, this is a question that comes up fairly frequently on our community seminars for patients, which we host monthly. Do you still do the NUS procedure for patients who have syndromes, including Marfan's or Ehlers-Danlos? The answer is yes. It's not a it's not an absolute contraindication to have a connective tissue disease and undergo the NUS procedure, okay? What's important is that you're screened. If you do have a connective tissue disease, it is identified, that's extremely important, before you undergo the procedure, that you rule out any aortopathy, meaning a uh, dilatation and abnormality of the aortic root, extremely important to identify that preoperatively. Um, and to make sure that patients understand that the response to the bar, if you have a connective tissue disease, can be different than if you don't. And by that, I mean patients with connective tissue disease that have undergone the NUS procedure will often have a sort of oh, an exaggerated response to the pressure of the bar. So the bar is meant to bring the chest forward into a corrected position. However, if you have a connective tissue disease, the force to bring you into correction can sometimes cause a connective tissue patient to overcorrect, to tend to become almost carinotum-like. And so it's essential that in patients with connective tissue disease, you under, not over, correct them. And if they begin to have that exaggerated response to the bar, that you consider removing the bar sooner than three years. That would be a patient, that would be a situation in which I would remove the bar at two years rather than three years if the patient were showing signs of this, you know, uh, exaggerated response to the bar. Any other questions? Dr. Lasasso, how do you determine the number of bars needed on a particular patient? That's an excellent question. It's really an intraoperative decision. So the approach, and this has been true since Dr. Nuss first described his operation, the first bar needs to go under the severest point of the deformity. And by that, I mean the bar needs to go in under the deepest part of the deformity where the chest wall is closest to the spine, okay? You wanna put the first bar there and then you assess thoracoscopically by looking inside the chest with the telescope, how the chest wall has responded to the force of that first bar. The objective being that you wanna get the chest wall up and off the heart, okay? So that's very obvious when you look through the thoracoscope at the resultant anatomy. So if the first bar lifts the chest wall up adequately such that it's that you've corrected the chest wall deformity and the chest is up off the heart, then you're done. If there's a remaining portion of the chest wall that is still sunken and is close to impacting the heart, then you put another bar in and the bar goes either 
one above or one below where the deepest part of the deformity is. And the chest wall dictates that. And you can see that through the scope. Dr. Lasasa, when do you think, when do you expect to be doing the next community seminar such as we're doing tonight? Or we also have patient seminars on a monthly basis normally. So I'm gonna do a really great one at the end of the month uh, where I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, how sports and pectus um, interact and discuss specifically through the eyes of a few very accomplished uh, athletes who I've had the good fortune of treating over the years through their eyes, what it meant as an athlete to undergo the NUS procedure. So that's my next community um, seminar. And that uh, is going to be the last Thursday of this month. Help me with the date. It is- I believe it's the 29th. The 29th, yes. it is exactly the date. The you can always find more information on our website, nestprocedure.com, and that will allow you to register and sign in as well. And I hope that'll be really interesting to a lot of young athletes who are out there in, you know, in the uh, chat rooms of the various support groups, uh, wondering about whether or not they can undergo the NUS procedure and still have an athletic career as high school or college athletes. So I, I wanted to address those concerns. I wanted to address those questions. And I wanted these athletes in their own words to be able to describe uh, to their fellow athletes what it meant for them uh, to undergo this uh, life-altering corrective procedure. Um, I am working with Zimmer Biomet to uh, look for another uh, professional-based uh, um, webinar. I'm hoping to do that in the next couple of months. I'll, I'll keep you posted and we'll have some information on my website as to when the professionally-based next seminar is to be given. But we've had a, a wonderful response to these webinars. And it's been so gratifying to me that I've been able to reach out to the primary care community and provide pediatricians and primary care physicians of all kinds with the information that is necessary in order for them to identify the various types of pectus deformities, um, provide them with the basic information necessary to uh, help them uh, direct the patient to an appropriate uh, provider, uh, specialty provider, so that this workup uh, that is so vital to these patients and families can be done in an expert fashion and they can have the specific information that they so uh, need in order to make that next decision, which is, would I benefit? Would the quality of my life be enhanced by having this corrective operation. So, so. Dr. Lasasa, uh, we have a couple more questions. So, right ahead. I'm sorry. Go right no ahead. No problem. So, Lori, you have a question for us, and it's what's the recovery like and how long? I'm going to let Dr. Lasasa answer this question, but we also do have a number of previous webinars on our website, nestprocedure.com, that will address that in more detail. But, Dr. Lasasa, what's the recovery like from a NUS procedure and how long? Great. So the operation, uh, from the day of the operation to the time of discharge from the hospital is generally uh, three, three to four days, okay? When you're discharged home, you generally are encouraged to walk and deep breathe uh, as the sole um, exercise that you do for approximately three weeks. This is during the acute phase of healing. Once those three weeks have, uh, uh, have passed, the wounds are healed, you're, you're, you're walking uh, comfortably about 30 minutes 
uh, two to three times a day, then you're ready to undergo physical therapy. I have a complete physical therapy program that I have developed with an excellent physical therapy practice in San Diego. Um, and that uh, program lasts for eight weeks. So for 16 sessions, twice a week, for eight weeks, you undergo physical therapy. That gets you to a point where you're about three months post-op. You come see me. If you're doing great, you can then begin to do sports-specific exercise and return to competitive sports, depending on your sport, somewhere at that five to six month uh, mark. And then you come back and see me yearly until the bar is removed. That's the essentially the continuum of care. All right, we have another question, Dr. Lasasso. Do patients who have undergone surgical correction of this condition at an early age need surgical revision due to advancement of their age later on? Great question. Once corrected, the correction is permanent. That's the key. Once corrected and corrected optimally, the correction is permanent. Now, getting to the optimal correction is where you know, the rubber meets the road. You have to do a good operation, get the patient through that process and, and, the, and the bar out at the appropriate time. But at that point, if the correction is optimal and you've waited the optimal time, then going forward, there should be no need for any further surgery and your correction at that point should be permanent. Anybody else have any questions that I can add answers to? If you'd like to re raise your hand and ask live, I can definitely unmute you or you are allowed to unmute yourself. We've appreciated everyone who's attended. Dr. Lasasso, do you have any final comments? I just want to thank Zimmer Biomet and, and my amazing team that surrounds me um, uh, for the uh, support and, and help in providing this information. And thank you, the audience, for tuning in. And I hope this has been uh, a, a very profound educational experience for me, for you. And if you have any further uh, uh, questions or concerns, please reach out to me directly in my office. I'd be more than happy to discuss with you individual patients and individual concerns that you may have. Thank you, everyone. As follow-up, we host all of the recordings from our webinar series is on our website, nestprocedure.com. This one will be up within the week. And thank you, Dr. Lasasso, for your time. Thank you, everyone, for all of your lovely questions. And again, we're always available. Our phone numbers are on our website. Zimmer Biomet would love to speak to you as well. And we will be sending out the CMA credit codes via email. So whatever you emailed as your registration address, they will follow up with your CMA credit information. Does that answer that question? Perfect. So, and also feel free to reach out to us. Again, our information's on our website if you have any questions regarding anything you've heard tonight. Dr. Lasasso, final comments? Thank you very much, Kate, for uh, your technical expertise and for your help in getting this uh, launched today. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night.